Hey, Dan, what's up? Why the frowny face? I am completely fed up with angry white folks hammering me on social media. No matter what I write, it seems that some branch of the white rage farming community picks a fight with me. I don't think I can take it anymore. Okay, Dan, I have a suggestion. Why don't you just let me make you an honorary Indigenous person? Yeah, that's what we'll do. I'm not entirely sure that's a thing. I mean, how am I supposed to become an honorary Indigenous person? Okay, listen. In our people, we can welcome anyone we want. We can invite them over for dinner. We can adopt them. If you want in, you're in. Uh, with my help, of course. I know you and I are pretty close, but I'm still not sure that other Indigenous people are going to think this is a good idea. Well, Dan, you know, I've actually done some research on this. And having spoken to a lot of the Indigenous community who listen to this podcast, contrary to popular belief, they say that you are the least objectionable white guy that they know. I'm not sure that's much of an accomplishment, but let's say I want to do this. How does it work? Okay, first we have to give you an Indigenous name. Something like, um, I got it. Megosh Kaji Enini. Just say that for me. Okay. Try it. Megosh Kaji Enini. Fantastic. Now, what does that mean? Uh, we'll get to that. Then we have an initiation ceremony. Uh, you'll be given um, a series of tasks. Uh, they'll involve mind-altering substances. I'll leave you naked in the bush somewhere, and I'll just let you figure it out on your way home. Wait a minute. That's basically that scene out of Bruce McDonald's film, Dance Me Outside, where a bunch of Indigenous kids make fun of a white kid by putting uh, him through a fake initiation okay, ceremony. Okay, okay, okay. You got me. You don't have to do any of that stuff. If you want in, you're in. So tell me, uh, my name, Magosh Kaji Anini, wh what does that mean anyways? Annoying man. Uh, so w w what are you going to do as your first official act as an honorary Indigenous person? Well, uh, now that I know the meaning of the name, I'm going to change all my social media handles to annoying man. The Winnipeg Free Press proudly presents, in partnership with CJNU 93.7 FM, Nigan and the Lone Ranger. Here are your hosts, Nigan Sinclair and Dan the Lone Ranger Let. Bonjour, Tan, say hello everybody. Welcome to another episode of Nigan and the Lone Ranger. And it's a big moment because we have a president of the United States has been a former president that's been found guilty of all charges and people are saying a porn star has saved America uh yeah I'm gonna wait a little while before I get into <laughs> who's saving what uh in America but I do know I was at the gym when the verdict came in you know I got my New York Times uh, news breaking news alert went to the app. It was fantastic because uh, the New York Times app is pretty cool, but they replicated, um, you know, like the big single headline front page. And it just said Trump guilty on all counts. And it was just like, I, you know, honestly, I was surprised and uh, was showing it to everybody. Yeah, it was crazy. That it was sort of universal. And uh, there's been a few interesting sort of funny things on social media. We ran in the free press an immediate announcement that uh, Trump can now no longer enter Canada because of being convicted <laughs> of a felony. Yeah. Uh, but One the, of the worst parts of the whole thing. For I, him, I just I'm posted sure, you know. uh, my own opinion. People can check that on the social media on, I, I called it freedom. <laughs> so, uh, but I... Uh, but there was also a really interesting uh, meme, people, like, because they keep saying, we're going to make an appeal, we're going to appeal this. But then somebody posted the picture of who are the appellate judges in New York, and they're all African-American women. Yeah. Uh, wrong audience, uh, wrong time. No, the best part for me was, because, you know, there's some speculation about the conditions, like the sentencing. Will there be any jail time? He Will he have, pick up yeah, garbage on the side of a highway? Or, or service. yeah, whatever. But the, the one thing that everybody seemed to agree is that, um, you know, he has voted in Florida. He's always voted in Florida where he has Mar-a-Lago and, you know, that's, that's what he considers to be his permanent residence, even though he obviously is a big New York City guy. But in Florida, your, uh, felons are not allowed to vote until they complete their full sentence. <laughs> So that would mean like even if he was sentenced to probation, he would have to go through several years of probation before he would be allowed to vote. So, ha, if there, that's a, if there that, is anything know. 
uh, that this trial and the charges and maybe the entire Trump presidency, just unprecedented, unprecedented, unprecedented. I mean, people just, the systems do not know how to handle this incredible series of anomalies, if you can call them anomalies. And uh, the, in many ways, they've exposed a great deal of gaps for people who decide to flout or ignore or just outright deny the law. Yeah, I think that, that the first Trump presidency was when a lot of Americans, a lot of people around the world began to see the fragility of democracy. Uh, and remembering, of course, that all of the periods in, of, of history that involved, uh, you know, uh, the worst, uh, expressions of dictatorship and authoritarian rule started with the co-opting of democratic institutions, the passing of legislation, uh, you know, the, the issuing of, of policies and regulations to bureaucracies to enforce uh, racist or authoritarian, you know, so it's, it, it never, nobody ever just steps in and declares it to be a dictatorship. You know, they slowly, you know, kind of work their Move way into and democratic. Away and- yeah. And it, so, I mean, I think people saw how close they were to something like that in the first, uh, Trump presidency. And right now, you know, like the, <laughs> Like I, I point to the, you know, there's the, 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 the doc, the confidential documents case in Florida and a judge that Trump appointed has basically thrown the game. Like she's basically perverted the, the, the progress of the trial to delay it beyond the election in really shameful and transparent ways. I mean, there's no mystery <laughs> about what she's doing. Well, but, you know, once the judiciary, it's not just a difference of opinion or a philosophy. Once the judiciary begins to subvert the very law, the, the, you know, or, yeah, the, the justice system to serve a uh, politician, then, you know, you've moved another step closer to the bad, bad place. The, this story is yet to play out. It really is true that this isn't done and we certainly will see the sentencing. But on top of that, like, uh, what's the major role with, um, you know, the number one thing that Trump did when he came out, when he, there was the conviction, um, and it was that saying, oh, this was a riding that, or uh, this was a state that has minimal support that was, uh, intended or biased from the beginning and, and, when a jury is 100% finding you guilty in that the short period of time, uh, there is certainly ways that you can co-opt this verdict, regardless of how much evidence, regardless of the justice that the trial took place and or the, the balanced arguments, whatever you want to say. Uh, this will be co-opted and put into a political framework. And, and undoubtedly what will happen is the, uh, the sentencing is only a couple days before the national Republican convention. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, in a broader sense, th- there are various phenomena flowing through the U S electorate that are defying, um, you know, history, and what we know about pu- how public opinion affects voting and, um, you know, terms like Trump amnesia have now worked their way into the basic political discord. So, you know, um, I've been reading in the Washington Post, the New York Times and other, you know, legitimate <laughs> news organizations, uh, stories where they're interviewing voters who voted for Trump in 2016 and 2020. Uh, and, um, people who are undecided. And it's, it's remarkable that they don't care about the trials and the criminal charges. Uh, they seem to think, well, you know, uh, the economy was much better and I was in much better shape financially when Trump was president. So I guess it was Trump. I, you know, I want. That's actually the number one argument I always hear from yeah. people who are Americans and support Trump is my investments we're more rich or making more money under Trump or uh, I can just see this story as uh, endlessly spiraling and maybe it's the time of year. Maybe, you know, we are springtime uh, here in Winnipeg and Manitoba. It's just been kind of a weird spring full of rain and full of uh, a very, um, it doesn't quite feel like summer here or spring. It kind of feels like a prolonged winter uh, that just won't go away. Yeah. I'm wondering, is the, um, is the drought over? Nobody said it. I think people are afraid to say it. 
I just said it, but no, I mean, I asked it, <laughs> but it is, but like, it makes me wonder, uh, I should probably write this as a column. Like I should pursue this as a journalist and ask some questions of more knowledgeable people, but no, but I mean, seriously, like it does make me wonder if, you know, we're, are the farm, we, you know, like the farmers are, are we happy. past the threshold of, of where we don't have to worry as much about wildfires and go to the old good Manitoba days of worrying about floods? Yeah. We've probably screwed the whole thing just by even suggesting that was possible, you know, like we're, but, but uh, no, it's, it's been a very, but I would like to say that despite the fact that it's been slow in coming, today is an important day of spring. What? Why would, what makes today so special? Let me look at the calendar here. Well, because it's short pants day. So this is the, the day that I put my short pants on. Oh, and I, and I don't pull it out of the uh, old trunk and then here you go. Yeah. And it's short pants now from now until October 1st. Yeah. You are resistant right till October. No, no. I'm, this is, I'm taking the moment to declare it. You know, it is short pants season, bitches. Get with the program. (laughs) Okay. Or like it's definitely for the podcast. This is it. Less clothes Uh, is more now. For recording the podcast. That's a, that's a new slogan for a t-shirt right yeah. here. Less is. clothes is more now. Uh, I, I, that makes sense. I'm so glad this is a podcast and we don't <laughs> have to televise this. Um, you know, uh, before we get to our feature interview, uh, it would be remiss and impossible for us not to talk about the last 48 hours here in Manitoba. Um, it's coming up to Pride Week. Yeah. And a really big time in Manitoba. Um, people are flying in from all across the country. You know, Pride in Manitoba is a long honored tradition. There's a humongous LGBTQ2 plus community that takes a great deal of investment going all the way back to the 1970s, 1980s to talk about what the importance of, of, uh, recognizing our relations, caring for our relations. And in the Manitoba legislature on Thursday, uh, Logan Oxenham, who's a MLA for the NDP, uh, in Kirkfield Park. We've talked about, uh, Logan for a number of times during the by-elections now in government. Uh, there was uh, a bill, Bill 208, which was introduced by the Manitoba government, which recognized a two-spirit and transgender day of visibility, which ended up in, I guess we'll call it a hate thon or what do we, what do we, <laughs> what, do we what do we want to call it? We call, it turned into a, uh, a, an important discussion around recognizing, uh, trans, two spirit and transgender people in Manitoba, uh, simply just recognizing that they have a day of visibility. It and coincides with the international day of on, visibility for non-binary and transgender people. And a series of MLAs from the opposite party, the conservative party, uh, voted against it and some were wanted to talk about their vote and some didn't. Yeah, it's okay. So, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people who listen to the podcast will understand the background. We're going to go back to last uh, provincial election campaign in a desperate bid to uh, stave off defeat at the hands of the NDP. The progressive conservatives launched a couple of really toxic uh, themes in their campaign. One of them was a very vague reference to how the PC party was going to be the party of parental rights. Um, as much as they, they tried to soften their stance or kind of muddy the waters. So parental rights is the lexicon of the anti uh, LGBTQ plus community, you know, uh, movement. Basically ha- par- parents yeah. having control over what kids see are exposed to, and then therefore can make choices about. Uh, well, I would say that's what they say it is, but really what it is, is a small group of parents wanting to tell everybody's kids and oh, parents. Oh, hundred percent. I yeah, was trying what, to be the most uh, diplomatic I could be there. Yeah. Uh, excellent job. And, uh, I'll just, I can't <laughs> wait to hear the reader and listener response to your, your objectivity. Um, so yeah, so they, they kind of flirted with this, uh, uh, you know, it's it's really hard to tell what impact it it had. Certainly, drew a lot of criticism. Uh, and uh, now that they're in opposition, the PC party is conducting a value survey, and the president of the party, Brent Pools, has come out and said that neither parental rights nor the uh, hey, we're the party who won't search the landfill crap that we also went through that that that's not what the pc party is about he's he's disowned those policies totally disavowed but the elected caucus those who remain have not disavowed it and so when logan oxenham introduced this private members bill 
uh, and not to uh, diminish the importance that Logan and others in the NDP would put on having a day to recognize uh, two-spirit, non-binary, uh, and transgendered people. It's it's a separate issue, but it's also primo politics. I was going to say, yeah. it's it's hard not to see this as political, uh, but it also, you know, not to take in any way the importance of the day, and I think we all know that uh, we all have to do better as a society to recognize and see our two-spirit and transgender relations, and we have them in government, uh, the Deputy Premier of Manitoba. And so, uh, importantly, this was something that passed, of course, uh, because with the majority NDP, but then things got really ugly because the the conservatives really don't have a uniform response to this issue. So being exposed, uh, it was a free vote day, meaning yeah. you're allowed yep. to vote how you wish or according well, that, to your that, constituents that, that is or the, your the conscience. PC, the PCs decided that it was a it was a free, free vote, vote for, them, for them. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. yeah, for them. And so uh, we saw uh, some PC MLAs support it, uh, many more did not. Uh, and some wanted to talk about it and some didn't. But uh, what ended up happening was kind of this, um, we could talk about what who wanted to talk about who didn't want to talk about it. But then uh, it, Premier Wab Canoe really turned this into an issue of how dare you vote against this bill. He called it a hateful and shameful act. He said, no one's asking you to go to pride. No one is asking you to be gay. Uh, how can the PC caucus allow themselves to be divided? And calling it, of course, a shameful display and an act of hate. You know, pretty strong words. Yeah, strong words. And, um, you know, everybody will have to make up their own mind about whether the whiff, more than whiff, the stench of political opportunism uh, undermines what the NDP is saying. I, I would say that, you know, um, only two of the Tory MLAs who spoke uh, who voted against would actually explain why they did it. And so I'm going to give a uh, little respect to Conrad Narth, who is a rookie um, uh, uh, Tory MLA. So he voted against it and he came right out of the chamber afterwards and he faced reporters and he told them why he didn't like it. And I mean, the, the issue is there is a reference in the bill, uh, you know, uh, to the fact that Youth are self-determining when it comes to gender identity, agency, yeah. uh, agency and that, uh, you know, also that they should have access to whatever medical uh, care that they need to support uh, their decisions. And of course, that is at the crux of the parental rights movement and the uh, anti-LGBTQ plus uh, is this idea of particularly um, younger youth uh, and decisions that they may uh, make to uh, alter their gender uh, medically. And, um, you know, so the bill, it, it's very clear where the bill stands. It And Narth, you know, respect. I, I disagree completely with what he said. Uh, and the other thing is that also he he's one of these things like, uh, you know, I'm, I've never – I'm inclusive. Like I've never excluded yeah. anybody and, and I don't hate anybody. He gets the anybody. quote of the day actually. And, <clears throat> yeah. and the quote of the day that he had, he said, I've never hated a person in my life, said Narth. Uh, what I saw during question period today though was absolute hate from the other side of the floor. Yeah. <laughs> Which so, turned into, yeah. like I said, a bit of a hate-a-thon of who can hate each other more. And that whole thing took away, I think, from a really important uh, recognition yeah. of a day in Manitoba. Well, Conrad should understand that the the uh, rather intellectually tenuous argument that criticizing for me, me for my hate is hateful. Because, uh, okay, so that, uh, you know, he's from a rural writing and I'll, that dog don't hunt. Uh, you know, like it's, uh, you know, and... When you oppose something that would provide mental health and primary medical support to people who are more likely to suffer from mental illness and, and be vulnerable to things like suicide, who are subjected to so much hate and systemic discrimination. So when, when you take steps to oppose supports and protections for those people, if you don't like the word hate, then, you know, we'll try to come up with some other word. But what you're doing is you are leaving someone vulnerable. And so you are, in fact, excluding somebody from the same protections that you and your family have. It's certainly a moment where you 
uh, wonder how many fingers are being pointed back and who's pointing what finger at whom. And, yep. and there's a whole uh, a series of things. You know, uh, Calvin Gertzen, uh, former leader, also former had, interim premier, former yeah. interim premier. Uh, did also, he was the only other person to make a comment of what his vote was. He wasn't in the House he voted or the legislature virtually. and voted yeah. virtually. Uh, what did he have to say? Well, I mean, you know, he he was consistent, uh, a little more elegant because he's also more experienced. But, you know, that uh, uh, he represents Steinbeck uh, and Kelvin has actually been fairly consistent and on the record that, you know. And on he, the podcast. Yeah, yeah, and on the podcast. That's right. Uh, not quite a friend of the podcast, but we'll get him back and we'll get him. We'll, we'll punch his card a couple more times. Uh, the, um, no, it, it's, uh, like, I think, you know, most people by now understand the structural arguments that people have against, uh, you know, some parts of the, of this private members bill, but also the, you know, the debate over how and when uh, youth should be provided with uh, gender affirming or gender altering support. And, you know, it like it's it's a tough issue. But the point is, and and where, um, you know, like uh, Wayne Owasco, who's the interim conservative leader right now, progressive conservative leader, he voted for the bill. So, you know, like, I, I don't want people to think that the entire party. No, that's what I mean. I, yeah. It's important to mention that there were people who voted for the bill from the conservative side. And this is a recognition of a day. This yeah. is not the uh, recreation or the extension of a holiday of some kind that will, uh, people, many Manitobans may not even notice that this day is, maybe they're already doing things to recognize that day and transgender and uh, people. Yeah. And, uh, no. But, you know, like probably the biggest issue, of course, yeah. is that, a huge amount of conservatives abstain from the vote, which yeah. says that this is such a complex, uh, conflictual issue in the party. It's almost like someone wanted to expose that. Yeah. You know, uh, this, uh, just a personal view here, uh, like I do anything else on this podcast, <laughs> right? But, but, uh, no, but seriously, personally, I am, I am so annoyed by abstentions. Um, the the most flattering way you can justify an abstention is to say, honestly, I don't know enough about this issue to say one way or the other. Uh, now, uh, mitigating that as a legitimate excuse is you're a blankety blank elected member of the Manitoba legislature, and you've got no business showing up for a debate and uh, on third reading of a private member's bill that's dealing with an important subject and not know like not be educated enough. So that, that doesn't fly for me. Uh, I'm in particular, um, I'm concerned about the fact that Abi Khan, uh, the PCMLA for Fort White, uh, the and many people yeah. might expect a leadership campaign in the future from. Yeah. I'll be Mr. surprised Khan. if he doesn't. Uh, but, and I think, you know, given that he's already elected, uh, to the, uh, you know, to the legislature, that gives him a huge advantage. Um, but, uh, he abstained and, uh, I have, I'm just, I'm just going to check my email here to, to make sure that I don't, um, so, oops, sorry. I'm just checking, checking, checking. Uh, <laughs> An email pause moment for the pause. Yeah, uh, no. First, I believe. So I, I put in a, a question to his office, all of his emails, all of his offices this morning. As of uh, the moment we're recording this, I haven't even received an acknowledgement that they've received my request for an interview with uh, with Abby. And 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 here's the thing. Again, I think, and this is where I disagree with them. But Narth and Gertson said why they don't like it. Okay, so that at the very least is part of the debate. Uh, and I do think it's an issue that that needs to be debated. And, and, and the fact is, you know, you know I, I obviously I think people would know where I stand on it. Um, but I would even, you know, like I want to hear from Manitobans who might not feel comfortable with this bill. We can get yep. out in the open. And I think most of all, we can talk about the very important issue yep. uh, that we talked about earlier, which is that transgender two-spirit youth uh, are deeply in issue, uh, if been infected in me mental health on this issue, yeah. around suicide. And yeah. so we, that affects everybody. So everyone's going to be part yeah. of the conversation. I, I think also to like, um, you know, physicians and their patients are the best people to sort out um, issues, you know, regarding medical care. This is first and foremost about 
protecting people in society, that there should be no debate. When I said it was, there are issues to be debated, I guess what I'm saying is we do need to allow people to have their say about it in the hopes that it's a debate that moves people to the right side of things. Yeah. The fact that there are some progressive Putting youth at the center, all youth at the yeah. center is yeah. always, that should be the goal of all of us. But uh, yeah, abstaining and then not explaining your abstention is quite frankly, uh, I think these, these people need to explain why it is they want to be elected, you know, politicians. Yeah, if, you, if you're not going to take a stand for anything, then... What are you, what are you there, what are you there for? Yeah. If you, you know, yeah, like it's, uh, it, it would be kind of like, you know, a newspaper columnist, you know, saying, yeah, that's a really good issue, but I'm not going to write about that because I'd have to take a side on it. <laughs> you know, actually, you know, I realized I may have actually done that. <laughs> um, speaking of, uh, taking stands and, uh, people who have been on the podcast and people who we have, uh, almost friend, maybe soon to be friend, maybe two already thirds friend. Along, two thirds along the way. I think we've determined that mm. almost friend of the podcast, uh, Jagmeet Singh, uh, is our special guest this week. He, he was in town, uh, and, uh, like we seem to be getting lucky lately is p- federal leaders who come through town. Uh, we get them on the pod. You were able to get a interview, uh, that was kind of off quietly in a corner. And, uh, we're very lucky. Those of you, we, I think everybody knows who, uh, um, Mr. Singh is, but he's, uh, the member of parliament for Burnaby South. Uh, he's been heading up the NDP for a number of years now in 2017. And then on top of that has went into several federal election campaigns as the leader and is probably best known, I think, for some of his confrontations with hate. Uh, that was really where he entered the federal scene, where he became kind of a household name in the country. And now he is the first Sikh and the first member of a visible minority group to be elected to lead a major federal pol- political party in Canada. So uh, we're very happy to get Jagmeet on the on the pod again and uh, very happy that you got the interview. Yeah. Uh, so just I think we might have even mentioned this before when we talked about uh, the interview with <laughs> Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, you know, uh, when... Y- you're not doing well in the polls, which the liberals and the NDP aren't. Everybody wants to be on your podcast. <laughs> it's, and, uh, it's the best time yeah. for us. <laughs> and when you're, when you're running ahead, um, like, uh, Mr. P- uh, Polyev, uh, is with the conservatives, uh, they don't return your emails. And it's not, we're not, I, you know, Mr. Polyev and your, people. I'm not taking it personally. I understand. I've been around, you been know, around. and I, I know how these things work. I will say that I, I do not, I do not really have a horse in the race. So I don't really care if you win or you don't win, you're up, you're down, whatever. I do hope that your numbers drop to a level where you kind of think we're a viable option again. <laughs> <laughs> That's another <laughs> free, that's another T-shirt <laughs> slogan. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, when your numbers the, get low yeah, enough, the, you come on the Negan and Lone Ranger the, podcast. That's right. Yeah, where it's you know, and and I will say, we have yet to prove that there is a Negan and the Lone Ranger bump. We, so we, you know, I think this is this is a major source of yeah. just radical turnarounds. So, uh, but you know, all joking aside, yep. uh, we are so happy that uh, we get time with people in the, across the country. Uh, we have a big interview coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. You'll hear more about it later. Uh, but right now, let's get to our feature interview with uh, federal NDP leader uh, Jagmeet Singh. I'm happy to tell you that this as your second appearance on the podcast, you are one appearance short, one more uh, punch in your card from being officially a friend of the podcast. Wow. Yeah. And uh, Nagan claims that you get a t-shirt once you're a friend. Now, we don't have them yet, but uh, once if you're brave enough to wear Nigan and the Lone Ranger, we're definitely <laughs> <laughs> going to give you a t-shirt. Yeah, if you give me a t-shirt, I'll wear it. Okay, sure. that's fantastic. I'll even take a picture of it and send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for making time. Busy, busy time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, I mean, federal leaders are coming in and out of Manitoba now, like, uh, <laughs> you know, almost every day. Um, and I, you know, I thought long and hard about, like, what did, so what did I want to ask you? Yeah. Uh, that, you know, maybe somebody else hasn't asked you. So I'm just going to start with the, the question that I really want to answer, which is what the hell is going on? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, in what way? In what well, way? you know, like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm like reading all the tea leaves like everybody else and I'm looking at polls and oh, I'm yes. watching social media. And, uh, you know, it's, I almost feel like I want to pull that, 
that speech from uh, Bill Murray's from Ghostbusters, you know, like uh, up is down, left is right, oh, yeah, yeah, dogs yeah, yeah. and cats sleeping together, you know, yeah, like yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. mayhem. It is. It, it's not an exaggeration to say that the political environment is mayhem right now, is it? Mm. It's. I mean, yeah, things are things are pretty volatile, I guess, right now. Things things are all over the place. I would say, but I would couch it and bring it down, like ground it in the fact that I think fundamentally people are just upset because things are tough. I guess yeah. it's tough for folks. And things are tough. And I say the, the biggest thing that I hear is, I guess, in Winnipeg and Manitoba, it's slightly softer. This is not as, as harsh. Mm-hmm. The housing kind of affordability, but still it's, it's become mm-hmm. more of a pressure point for people in, in Manitoba than ever before. But cost of living is definitely up. Yeah. And the major thing that people tell me about when they say cost of living, they think about their, their regular expenses and they look at their groceries. The first, probably the first mm-hmm. thing that people tell me things like their cell phone fees and their, their internet fees are really high, which is with reason. It's the highest. We're amongst the highest in the world. Yeah, so and have been for a while and yeah. have been for a while. So yeah. So those things are, there's there. And they see that they feel like they, they've got a federal government that's. That's known this or must have seen this and hasn't done anything about it for, for nine years now. So they feel like things have gotten worse, not better. And that is a big problem. And so people are frustrated. And then I feel like they, so they're telling me that we're frustrated with the liberals. We're, we're upset. We're done with them. And then they're trying to say, well, who's going to, who's mm-hmm. going to look out for us? And people are saying, well, I'm worried about Paul Pierre Bollier. There's a lot of worry. It's not like there's this. This big romance where people love him. They're like, oh, I'm worried about him. I want an alternative. It might be him, but I'm worried about him. I'm worried mm-hmm. about the things that he would do in conservatives. And Manitobans know that conservatives, they just came off of an election where they rejected conservatives because they did cut the services that people needed, like health care and education. So they're worried about that. So, okay, but uh, would you go as far uh, as to say, and this is parenthetically, <laughs> Uh, this is kind of one of my bugaboos. Like I, in terms of, I love a good, a bit of political hyperbole. Uh, I mean, I live in it, right? But, uh, the country is broken. Mm. Okay. So like I see, I tend to have kind of almost a visceral reaction to that because, um, you know, uh, times are tough. Uh, they're tough everywhere. I, I don't know if there are any isolations, uh, you know, isolated places in the world that don't have problems, but like accusing uh, or, or alleging that the country is broken. I mean, that's a pretty powerful image. Is that like, is that a, a bit of hyperbole too far for the NDP? Well, we, we don't say that. Yeah. I, that's something that, that Pierre Polyev says, and he says it with reason because he wants to make the case that government is a problem. Mm-hmm. He, that, that's the case he's trying to make. He's trying to say, oh, you know, for all your problems, it's actually the government. And what he's doing purposely and knowingly is ignoring the glaring problem is that Ottawa for too long has been working for big corporations and not for people. Because mm-hmm. when we say people are hurting, you say, yeah, it's, it's hurting mm-hmm. everywhere. Eh, there's a big group of people or a significant group of people that are not hurting. No. And that's our big corporations are making record profits. The corporate grocery stores are making more money than ever before. Oil and gas companies are making more money than ever before. And I'm saying record profits, not just good profits. For those two sectors, they're record. Highest ever. Highest ever. And then we know the tech sector is making profit. We, you know, corporations are doing well. The CEOs are doing well. It's working people that aren't doing well. So really the problem is not, is not that, that government's broken. It's that government's been working for the wrong people. Yeah. The wrong people are benefiting. And or put better, everyday people are hurting because decisions aren't being made in their interest. And so I point to some things that we can do. Mm-hmm. We we can take on corporate greed. Mm-hmm. Like we can stop that with the cell phone fees and internet fees. That's fully regulated by the federal government. They've allowed mm-hmm. Bell, Rogers, and Telus to be ripping us off. It doesn't have to happen. We can con- completely control that. On corporate grocery stores, there are a lot of examples how they are abusing their dominant market share and they are ripping us off because of it. And it's not really hard to believe if you go back a couple of years, 2018, mm-hmm. they were found guilty of colluding, hey, working together to rip prices. us off on bread prices. Yeah. So they, they've done this. It's not hard to believe that they're doing it again. Like it's not by chance that all the corporate grocery yeah. stores are all enjoying record profits and all of us are having a hard time buying our groceries. No, for sure. The, the, the grocery uh, prices though is, 
from a regulatory perspective is a much different challenge. It's not a regulated industry. So there is no agency law or, and I, so, and I'm like, this brings me to another point, which is like housing is out of control. Costs are out of control. Uh, grocery prices are largely out of control, although I think mm-hmm. they've moderated a little bit recently. That's right. One of my main concerns, um, again, and I'm not saying this is part of the NDP narrative, but it's um, attacking the current government for failing to respond to an issue that really no future government uh, without some very radical moves is going to be able to solve. So housing, uh, like in Vancouver, like Vancouver, Toronto, Calgary, do we really think that it's within the government's power to to moderate to roll back rents and and uh, uh, the cost like the price of, of buying a house in those markets? Like, you know, I'm just I, I just wonder if in like we're feeding the anger mm. and with a disappointment coming on the other end. Mm, once I hear, uh, you, I hear you know, so I, I would temper. I would say yes, absolutely. There's lots we can do, but I would temper that by saying it's not easy though. Mm-hmm. And it is, and it is complex, but there are absolutely steps we can take. And so I wouldn't be so, so dismissive of the challenges and disrespectful to the to people with like a slogan that was going to solve it all. Like I hear the conservatives use. I think that's yeah. disrespectful and dishonest and doesn't do credit to what's really going yeah, on. Like I, like, I saw an email from conservative party, uh, uh, communications, uh, blaming the Trudeau government for a skyrocketing, like a spike in the number of extortions by organized crime. Yeah. Okay. So I understand, I understand that it's crime. You're right, right. You know, right. I understand that, you know, yeah. government has a responsibility, but you know, like there are some things. Yeah. Like yeah. I'm not going to blame Trudeau for it and I'm not going to blame Pierre Polyev if he can't solve it in the future. Right. Right. Like right, right. 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 Yeah. So, but, but there are things that, that, that I, I that we can point out concretely. Yeah. So while you're absolutely right, it's, it's great to have a conversation with someone who knows files so well that it's not a regulation fact issue with the grocery prices. But there are clear examples of our competition laws being too weak in Canada. Mm-hmm. We did a deep dive into this and we have some of the weakest competition laws in the world. And that has allowed these large corporate many sectors, but in this case, corporate grocery stores, to engage in lots of anti-competitive behavior mm-hmm. that would have otherwise been stopped in other jurisdictions. And raise prices. And, and raise prices. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, and so there's a lot of things. So what we're pushing for are changes to the laws that mm-hmm. govern competition in Canada. The Competition Bureau is an organization that does it, uh, that actually can significantly make life more affordable. And those laws can be changed and they can concretely protect consumers better from things that are making it harder for people to get good affordable prices for do, groceries. Do you not still need kind of a dedicated wing of an agency or a dedicated agency to monitor prices and flag, you know, uh, uh, suspicious? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, uh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the Competition Bureau does that in Canada, but yep. they've identified a whole bunch of gaps in their ability to do these things because they don't have the legislative powers that other jurisdictions do have. So we put in place, I put a bill forward that actually makes those changes. We push for changes in the fall economic statement as well as mm-hmm. the budget that strengthen protection for consumers because these are things that could have happened years ago that yep. the government ignored and we called for. We said, listen, do something about the corporate greed that's that's really driving up the cost of living for people. So there are absolutely things we can do on grocery side of things. We've also pointed to a tax on excess profits. And what this is, is a deterrence when a company is purposely or has engaged in behavior that is that is hurting Canadians or hurting people. Other countries have done this as a way to give people relief, but also to, to, to deter the, the bad action. And so the United Kingdom, Spain, mm-hmm. Germany have all put in place some form of Let's make those that are making record profits pay their fair share. Canada hasn't done that yet. So that's one thing. Uh, stronger laws to protect consumers. Another thing. Anti-competition behavior that's going on, stopping that. Going after some of these really concrete things mm-hmm. that we can do and, and we've called for. The, the, um, and and I'm, I hear you. And, like, and, I, and I do believe that there's lots of examples of other jurisdictions that have dealt with these issues and their economies did not collapse. That's right. Because That's right. of it. But I, right. I think the debate over the recent changes to capital gains is a good example. Like uh it's a pretty modest change. 
like when you get right down yeah, to it. Yeah, you know, We campaigned uh, on yeah. uh, going to 75%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and yet um, all the medical associations, uh, a lot of the uh, chambers of commerce, Canadian Federation of Independent, like all these organizations came out and said that this was going to hammer productivity. It was going to hammer capital investment. I mean, I don't know any nonpartisan economist who thinks any of that's true, but, <laughs> but like if that's like on this tiny little change, if that's the reaction the country is going to make, like voters are, they are influenced by these, these lobbies, right? So how do you, like, how do you introduce an aggressive tax on, uh, you know, excess profits and get elected, I guess is the question. Well, I mean, grocery stores are not very popular. So if no. we say we're going to target corporate grocery stores, which is what other countries have done, they targeted a certain sector. Industry, yeah. Absolutely. We can do yeah. We've done it on, we've been able to force this government to do something in terms of going after the excess or, or the greed of big banks. We've yeah. increased the tax rate on big banks and insurance companies. So we can do it. It can be done. And in fact, I would say it's popular. There's already, there's a movement where people are wanting to boycott going to the largest corporate grocery store chain, Loblaw. So yeah. there is, there is an appetite for it. So I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a public issue. I think it's the political will that, that the two major parties that have been in power, conservatives and liberals, don't have any interest in going after corporate yeah. greed. They're, they're too close to them, too closely associated. No, they're not willing to do it, but this is the right thing to do. And I should add on the housing piece. Again, it's not simple. And I, and I, and I don't want to be a dismissive or almost well, overly uh, simplistic. Yeah. Really, overly simplistic, you know, right yeah. about how serious the problem is, but there are key things that the government could have done and has not mm-hmm. done. And, and one of those, just to give you like a one mm-hmm. concrete example is, we said use federal land, money, and power to build homes that people can afford. Uh, the federal government has been using federal lands, but they haven't stipulated that the homes that yeah. are built on federal land are affordable. Or if or only a portion of them, yeah. Only a portion of them are. And so that's a problem. I would say every square foot of or square meter of um, land that we have federally should be dedicated purely to affordability. We went to other countries around the world to get a sense of like how they figure this out. And I met with the housing minister from Germany. And what they pointed out is they have a very diversified market, uh, housing market, where they've got a significant portion of homes that are built that are non-market, whether they're Mm -hmm. publicly owned or they're a cooperative or they're in a not-for-profit kind of structure. They have a massive amount of homes that people can rent or or some form of ownership that are not in that traditional market. There's, of course, private building as well. Yeah. But we don't have that blend here. No. In Canada, we barely have enough rental, let alone having non-market housing. So what we need to do is build homes that people can afford and look at all the different ways they can be truly affordable. And that has to be a big part of thrust. And government can't take a step back and say, oh, we're just going to incentivize building. We have to get back to what we did after the World Wars and really be actively building homes that people can afford. So, okay. So the NDP, um, I read an interesting um commentary uh, by David Coletto, um, which I th- thought was really like awesomely balanced. Uh, he made the point that um, contrary to some of the more shrill headlines that had come across, the NDP isn't really doing any better, but it's not doing any worse than it is. Like, you're sort of in that historical high teens, you know, to low twenties kind of range of public support. Um, he did say, though, that it was interesting that when you ask people, you know, if you're not going to vote uh, for your first choice, you know, what party would you consider voting for? So you have among the highest accessible voting pool, 40 percent, which I, I was, you know, I was really impressed by. Um, where are, are we in the evolution of the NDP right now? Mm. Are, are you do you do you need uh, Justin Trudeau to drive the, the big red machine right off a cliff <laughs> <laughs> as former leaders did, uh, you know, and, and throw them into some like an existential crisis so that, you know, you or any future NDP leader can have their sort of Jack Layton moment. Cause mm-hmm. it, it seems like, um, there's a lot of jockeying around between uh, the conservatives and the liberals and you guys are kind of there where you've been close, you know, to something big, but, you know, not being able to break through. So, like, where are we with the NDP? Uh, There's a very, very fair question. And I appreciate you took probably one of the most balanced and I think fair, (laughs) 
fair assessments of our don't, position. Don't tell people that. <laughs> but I get is, no respect or love for that. It's true. So. It's true. It is very fair, though. That, I mean, we, we acknowledge that's where we're at, that we're at a point. And I, I put it in back into, instead of putting it on in the frame of reference of us as a party, I would think about it through the, through the voter, through the person. And I say, okay, what are they going through right now? They're going through this point where they're like, I'm, I'm frustrated and fed up with the liberals angry. because they're angry. angry. Yeah. They're like, things aren't better. And then they're like, okay, so what is our choice? And then they look and they're, they're worried about the conservatives. They are truly worried. So it does open up and they say, okay, well, if I'm worried about them, what are these new Democrats going to do for me? And then it is on, that is, that is where, where I see a really powerful opportunity to make the case. Well, look at what we've done with our power. Just what's, what's the proof point? Tell you about Susan. Susan is a senior I met in Ottawa at a clinic that takes the, the dental care program. I met her on Monday, actually. So it was very fresh off the press. It was a very powerful moment that I had with her. She, a uh, cancer survivor, senior, retired, has a pension, not a great pension, not, but, but she can, yeah. she can make a go of it. Um, lost her teeth because of her, her therapy that put her cancer in remission and is in, in a, in a, in a rough way because it has left, a lot of her teeth are gone, but her roots are still there. Mm. And so it's, it's pretty, painful. it's pretty painful. It's pretty rough for her. And she said, uh, in the dentist chair when I was visiting the clinic with the dentist and the denturist, Dr. Lee and Jack, the denturist. Uh, and she said, I just, her name is Susan. She said, I just want my teeth back. And the dentist looked her in the eye and said, we're going to get you your teeth back. We're going to be able to take care of you. We're going to get rid of the pain. We're going to get your teeth back. And the dentist like, yes, we can get, and she knew that she needed, like she was going to need or implants or yeah. dentures. Uh, and she was, she's like, really? Like she was almost in disbelief. I said, yes, we're going to be able to do that for you. And it's going to be covered, this program. And she looked over at me, like I was just kind of off to the yeah. side and she grabbed my arm, like almost like someone that was drowning and just kind of grabbed my hand and said, thank you. And I looked at her and I said, no, don't thank me. This is what we're here. That's what I'm here to do. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to be able to share that this is working and that people can get this. That's what we've done for Susan and like millions of, two million seniors have signed up to this program. And parenthetically, what you've done through the agreement. That's right. With the That's liberals. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. With the agreement that we've, we've forced this government to do these things. I would, I would now say we, we've done this. People who are worried about the cost of living, it's not going to be easy. I don't want to suggest to you it's going to be easy, but there is a path for us to take it on to bring down the cost of groceries, to build homes that are affordable. There is a path for us to do this, and you can trust me to do that. And I feel very confident that I can, I can show people that we are a real alternative for them. So my personal uh, theory has been that when, like, like you, like when you talk to people and you listen to what's important to them and what they want, that uh, we, there should be more people voting federally for the NDP, uh, but they don't. Uh, and I, I think, uh, two things. I mean, one is, uh, muscle memory is an important element in voting, right? Yeah. Uh, I think that the second thing though is that the people who are most likely to support you, uh, are the least reliable in terms of showing up for elections. Uh, you know, the most, uh, perhaps, uh, disillusioned about the, the importance mm-hmm. uh, of their vote. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say to you, and I, I would like you to provide a, a counterpoint. I don't see the next election as an election that's going to drive record turnout. Mm. I mean, I think that with the the anger and the cynicism, I think uh, is going to uh, the noise of it will drive a lot of people out of the electorate. Mm. Uh, but I, you know, I like I suppose there are antidotes to that. It's just that that's my great fear is that it's going to be, you know, I, you know, I, I had never thought in my lifetime I would see less than 50% turnout in a federal general election. I'm actually kind of concerned that there will be. Well, well, I'm, I'm concerned about voter turnout in general. Like I, I mm-hmm. want more people to vote it's in our name of our party or the new yeah. democratic party. We want people to vote and we know that more people vote better choice, better, better decisions will happen. So. I guess you mentioned earlier we were chatting that the, what we learned from the Manitoba NDP and the Manitoba election is that a message of hope can work. And they fought and beat conservatives with a message of hope, a unifying message. They were up against a very divisive, very cynical campaign. I think mm-hmm. one that was very much designed to, to drive down voter turnout, mm-hmm. to make it as cynical as possible. And I think with 
with a strategic purpose that benefits conservatives. And people, I would say Premier Canoe now, uh, but at the time as leader, Wab Canoe believed that Manitobans were better than that. I believe in the goodness of Canadians. Yeah. I believe Canadians want to take care of their neighbors. I believe they want to look out for one another. And I believe there is a path to giving people hope that we can fix the big problems we're up mm-hmm. against and make things better and we can inspire people to come together. And I believe that's fundamentally why new de- oh, Canadians are so proud of things like our healthcare system while there's been problems, but it's still a, a source of Canadian pride, it's something that we look at and say, hey, we're, we're better off than lots of people in the world. We're better off than our neighbors yeah. to the south. By and large, Canadians believe that. So I would say I think there's an opportunity to give a message of hope that in this next election, they don't have to be stuck with the routine same choices. Old, old. Yeah. And and now I feel like they're in people are in a different position because they tell me they're they're done with the liberals, they're frustrated and angry, they're worried about the conservatives. There's an opportunity to say, well, you don't have to choose between these two. Yeah. There is another choice, a real choice for you. And we've shown you we can get things done. Yeah. I think often people have looked at us and said, You got great ideas, I don't know if you can get them done. We ran on dental care and pharmacare, lost the election, to put it bluntly. And we have delivered on both of those. Right. People are going to get free birth control, free diabetes medication and devices. We have delivered on dental care. People are getting it. It's actually happening. People are in dentist chairs already. I think we're at over, I think we're getting close to a hundred thousand. It's, it's well in the tens of thousands of, of seniors have already gotten care. So imagine every, every month more and more people are getting care. Mm-hmm. They're saying, oh, this works. And I say, we got that for you. We can also fix these other problems. Yeah. I think there's a, there's a powerful opportunity. So, uh, I mean, I think every election is an opportunity. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes you can't predict what's going to happen. The, the man, you met reference the Manitoba election. Voter turnout actually went down modestly overall. And, uh, the other thing is, despite the fact that, uh, I think the progressive conservatives here ran the, really the most toxic provincial election campaign in the history of the country, uh, they came within 25,000 votes. So the, the you know, uh, the NDP vote was very efficient, uh, and they won a, a convincing majority, but only with 25,000 more votes than the progressive conservatives. Again, what that, the caution for me is that, um, the angry constituency, uh, like the people who are the antithesis to the ones you've just described, they may be more motivated to come out and vote than the people who want progress, progressive, hopeful, like they want to see that they do better, that, you know, and that everybody does better. Yeah, everybody, yeah, yeah. you know, I heard a woman on Twitter the other day railing on about how she's heard the word fair too much. Mm. And I just, like, I, I can't in a million years understand where something like that comes from. But, uh, you know, why shouldn't that same phenomena manifest at the federal level, I guess is the question. I guess this really highlights something that I maybe did touch on. I, I want to not ignore that anger. I think a lot of times people, maybe in the, per, in the progressive side of things, kind of ignore the anger, jump over the anger and start like, oh, we'll fix it. I want people to, to be angry. That's okay to be angry because there's a lot of legitimate reasons why people are angry. Like, why is it that you can't afford your groceries? Like, it seems so basic. Like, mm-hmm. we should be able to have a job that pays enough to pay your bills, buy groceries, have a place to live. If you can't do all those normal basic things, it feels very frustrating and angry. I remember what it's like. I was 20 and my kid brother had to come live with me when he was 15. And I remember feeling that worry, but I was like a kid in university working minimum wage job. I don't want anyone to have to live like that. And people are living like that, like struggling and wondering how I'm going to get by. I just want to direct that anger at the real causes. The real cause of that is corporate greed run rampant because governments haven't protected you. And I want people to be angry at the right things. Be angry that a CEO is ripping you off and that your governments have let you do that, let them do that to you and know that I'm not going to let them do that anymore. And so I feel like what I present is an option, opportunity for people who are angry to say, like, let's be angry at what's actually dragging, you know, who is ripping you off when you pay your cell phone in your internet fees? Who is ripping you off at the grocery? Who's ripping you off at the pumps? Mostly the real driver of that is corporate greed. And who allowed that to happen? Well, liberals and conservatives. So I hope I can make that argument to them. Like, yes, let's be angry at the real causes that are driving up our cost of living 
and here are some real solutions. The, uh, obviously, uh, the conservatives uh, will uh, accentuate this point, and um, they they tend to have kind of a you know South American bee swarm kind of approach to social media uh, that you know you are you were in league uh, with the uh, with the liberals. I mean, we saw it even during the provincial election campaign. You know about the billboards that were here yeah, with you and yeah. Bob. Um, so, you know, how uh, do you need to, at some point, cut the tie? Like, what do you need to do to make sure that the, the, the liberal brand, if it is headed to the toilet, it doesn't drag you guys down yeah. in the swirl? Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, I need to, people need to know that, that we have fought them, that we are frustrated with them, that it's not. It's something that is, has offended me that they have so much power to fix the problems that people are going through, but have been so lackadaisical about it, so lethargic, so like non-urgent, no urgency. And I think people need to know that we fought to force them to do these things. It wasn't like we were holding hands and kind of going singing kumbaya or anything. It was, it was. This was a fight. This was a brawl. It was a knuckle brawl. We were fighting every step of the way to make these things happen. And it's something you can expect from me. I'm a fighter. Mm -hmm. I fought my whole life to get to where I am. Uh, I had to fight when I was a kid to defend myself. I fought in the ring as a, as a fight, as a martial artist. I fought in the court as a lawyer. So this is a, this has been a battle. It's been a fight. I'm a happy warrior. So people see mm -hmm. that happy side of me, but it's been a fight and I'm ready to fight. I've been born to fight and I will fight for people. So, uh, you know, I don't think I could over, uh, emphasize the fact that, uh, you among, uh, all of the federal leaders could probably decide when the next federal election is, uh, which is a daunting, uh, power to hold. Uh, there's no doubt that the liberals are looking forward to one more budget. Um, and, uh, do you have a clear sense of when you would like the next federal election to be? And, and if so, uh, it, you know, has the NDP worked on a strategy to call the election on your terms? Cause it literally, you can do that. We, I mean, there's a lot of weight knowing that we, we can, we're influencing government the way we are. So I, I take that very seriously. I look to the traditions of new Democrats. What do new Democrats do with our power? We've always used our power for people. Tommy Douglas used it to bring in Medicare, Stephen Lewis to bring in a lot of the social safety nets that we have, like our EI and our CPP and our old age security, all new Democrat uh, contributions that we use when we had power. Jack Layton did it when he had power. He used it for people. So I, I want to do that. I want people to be able to benefit from the things that we fought for so that when an election comes, it can be a referendum on do you want to keep dental care because we're going to keep it and expand it. Paul Yev will take it away. He's already said he will do it. So these are just facts. Uh, do you like that we, what we've done with, with free birth control and free diabetes medication devices? Or the choice will be Pierre Paul who wants to take it away. Uh, I want people to be able to experience the benefit of what we fought for to make their lives better and then have a real informed decision about whether they want to keep it or not. Because that's going to be the decision. It's going to be New Democrats will keep it. Conservatives will take it away. Pierre Paul will take it away. I will make sure you get that and more. And so I want that choice to be put to Canadians in a real honest way where they can actually choose, all right, there's a choice in front of me. Do I keep these things that we fought for or do we let the conservatives take it all away? So do you, are you increasingly seeing the next election as a battle between yourselves and the conservatives? Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of, uh, uh, polls and events and, you know, stuff that's going to happen between then and now. But do you, can you kind of foresee when that will be? It's kind of more, that was more the Jack Layton uh, scenario, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I see that more and more like that, that people, I mean, this is coming from people. When I, I speak to a lot of people across the mm -hmm. country, every province, uh, I tour regularly and I meet with real people and they've made it more and more clear to me that they're just fed up and done with the liberals. And it also makes sense. It's been, it'll be nine, 10 years. And historically, that's when people feel like you know, I'm just done with the government. So, I hear that. I see that. I think that's that's what people are telling me. And so then they're going to say, well, what's our choice? And then at that point, when they look away from the liberals and they look at their choices, it's really me or Polyev. And that is a choice I want Canadians to know, eyes wide open, what they're getting. 
With me, I am dedicated to fighting for working people. I've been in the struggle. I know what it's like to not have enough. I remember when my family lost their home and we had nowhere to live for a bit. I remember how hard I worked to make sure my kid brother wouldn't go hungry when I was in university and he was in high school. I remember those mm -hmm. moments. Or you got Polyev who wants to take away a school food program, who wants to take away dental care, who wants to take away pensions and EI. He's already said he would cut it. He wants to cut investments in healthcare. And that's the choice that Canadians will have. And I think more and more people think about what it means, like the price of Polyev. I don't think people really have considered the price. They're thinking, I'm upset with Trudeau and I'm mad at Trudeau. But what is the price of Polyev? I think that's something Canadians have to be confronted with before they can really make their final decision. And then I hope people say, well, you know, maybe it's not him. Maybe it's actually New Democrats. Maybe they're the guys that are going to yeah. have my back. Um, Yagmeet Singh, thank you for making some time. Uh, you, nobody on the podcast can see this, but there's like a staffer running back and forth, you know, like, like a gnome waving his arms, <laughs> trying to get me to stop the interview. So <laughs> politely, it was very, no, it was a very, very respectful wave. Like there wasn't any, you know, <laughs> cutthroat sign, but, uh, no, it's, uh, you've got a lot of work to do, uh, here in Manitoba yep. and, uh, you're opening up a campaign office That's on right. this, this Saturday, yeah. uh, that, used to belong to James Teitzma, the Tory MLA. <laughs> so that is the political metaphor. Warning yeah. sign is going off in the corner now. That's right. right. Now. That's right. We're going to put some incense here to kind of <laughs> purify the space. Yeah, the bad spirits. Um, <laughs> thanks very much for the time. Thank you. Uh, best of luck while you're still here. Yeah. And uh, one more visit to go before it, we're in T-shirt territory. That's so, right. Okay, good. cool. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Okay. Thank you. What a great interview with Jagmeet Singh and rather unplanned. Dan, what was the best part for you for that interview? Um, well, you mean other than uh, watching James Teitzman's sign get blown off the front of the building and come crashing down in an act of absolutely. Did we have insurance? Do we have insurance? For no, no, no. But it was like it, there are moments of, you know, of metaphor, like the, where a metaphor arrives and you got to write something and this thing happens and you go, oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, like it's, oh my God. So I don't have to, yeah. Whether yeah, you're a person of faith I don't or have not. To, or, you know, thank whatever, you know, God you pray to. But my point is that, you, you know, these things are, yeah, anyway. So that was the funny bit, um, you know, that the, uh, they rented the same space as, as James Deitzma, the, the provincial MLA who lost in the last election and they had to get rid of the sign. Uh, quickly, and they did it in the middle of a raging rain, rain and windstorm, and it broke. Uh, <laughs> more importantly, though, the interview with Yagmeet Singh. Okay, so um, you know, I, there are probably a lot of people who are wondering about the NDP and Singh because of their uh, their deal with the Liberals to keep them in in power in a minority parliament. And you know what? And that's like completely legitimate uh, issue uh, to use to determine whether or not they're worthy of support. Um, I think you do in the interview, you, you do need to listen a little bit to where they've moved the needle, uh, policy wise. It's pretty impressive. If you, if you add up all the things they were able to get done, I can't, I mean, studying all, um, the f infrequent times that there have been sort of al alliances between political parties to keep minority governments in power. I think this is probably the most biggest track record for someone in the, uh, minority position in that, uh, alliance mm -hmm. and the way in which they've been able to achieve what, if you go back to the federal election campaign, they promised several things, pharmacare, dental care, uh, dental care uh, areas, the childcare deals that have been across the country. Uh, these are things that the NDP are on the record for promising, not so much the liberals, but of course, I think many times the liberals are the ones who get, make, get to make the announcements for the pro yeah. a deal with the provinces. But it's hard not to see that the NDP maybe has been left behind. And I think they're trying to remind Canadians now mm. that they are the ones who brought these ideas forward and really forced the hands of the liberal. Well, you know, there are a lot of people who claim that they prefer minority parliaments. And uh, because they believe that it forces the governing party to consider more options and to broaden their policy, you know, landscape, uh, you know, beyond maybe what they campaigned on. 
So well, it, it, for, uh, I, I, yeah, go fosters ahead. Fosters an atmosphere of collaboration that might not otherwise be present in a parliament. Well, here, so here's, notwithstanding the fact yeah. that they didn't go into an official coalition, this no. was literally just almost like a supply and confidence arrangement. Yeah, and I guess it, you know the like that's an excellent point. And like further to that, it, I guess what I'm saying is, and I'm not asking anybody or telling anybody to vote for a particular political party. But if you are or were of the opinion that minority parliaments can be collaborative, two points. Number one is they are not normally collaborative, like not to this extent. And number two, just look at the results that that came from it and uh, at least consider that, uh, you know, when you're making – you know, value judgments about uh, uh, about political parties. I think as well – you know, and again, when you're the third place party in parliament, um, you have to the gla- you have to keep seeing the glasses half full. Singh's version of half full is, you know, going back to Jack Layton's breakthrough uh, when he, you know, he was leader of the party when they won over a uh, hundred seats in parliament, became the official opposition, largely because there was an implosion of the liberals under Michael Ignatieff. Okay, so we don't know if the liberals will ever reach the implosion stage right now. But the point is, they're, they're doing poorly. The prime minister is unpopular. Uh, when Singh says that that creates, oh, and they're, uh, you know, he's, uh, opposed by, uh, a party, the conservative party, which is doing well in the polls, but whose leader, Pierre Polyev, is not liked by Canadians. That creates an opening for the NDP and Yagmeet Singh. And he's not wrong when he says that. This is the longest serving uh, minority parliament alliance in history. And so, I mean, obviously it's got to have a track record. It's got to, you Mm -hmm. know, every single other uh, minority parliament that had an alliance lasted about half this amount. Uh, The only other one that's even comparable is going back to between 2008, 2011, almost 900 days. And so the point is, is that there's a a lot to look at here. And I think that it might be, we are living in unprecedented times, maybe seeing an unprecedented government, mm-hmm. whatever political stripe that they are, when people work together, and I think that's what Mr. Singh was talking about here, is things can get done that might be otherwise not done on a big wide scale. I mean, when would you see the number of national programs being rolled out by a federal government uh, to the tune of, I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars of social investment in the country at a time in which a lot of governments across the world are retracting and talking about austerity. No, it's an interesting period. And again, not not as uh, as advocacy to vote for any one party, um, but uh, there is great contrast right now in the federal uh, political, you know, forum. Um, you know, you you know, you really do. We are seeing a conservative party that is really, you know, sending signals about smaller government and less reach, um, and a minority liberal uh, governing party with the support of the NDP that is about you know more reach and bigger government and doing more. Um, without getting into, you know, the rights and the wrongs, because there is no right and wrong. It's just a difference of opinion. There, there is like, there really is no reason not to get kind of ramped up about an election that is probably going to take place next year. I will say though, that with an unpopular, uh, prime minister, uh, very unpopular prime minister and a very unpopular potential prime minister, leader of the conservative party, my greatest fear is that, and uh, we talked a little bit about uh, this with uh, Young Meat, is the the possibility of a less than fifty percent turnout in a federal election. And um, I'm going to say that I think it's going to happen, and I hope to come on the podcast. And uh, Nigan, you can tell me how wrong I was when everybody shows up to vote. But I really, I fear that I'm not wrong. And, no, I think you you're know, pointing to something important there. Uh, huge appreciation for you to to get that interview yeah, and no uh, you know i know you're always hitting the beat and and uh being there for the pod but well, also so, being someone's got to do the interviews well you because you're <laughs> you're out doing god's work man you know you're out you're out like you know help helping and healing and 
spirit guide. Doing a, doing a few things here and there. We'll just leave it at that. Um, but uh, but a huge thanks to everybody for uh, continuing to support the pod. And um, I think I've heard more from the past few weeks of listeners, uh, people coming up to me. Uh, I did a book launch last night at McNally Robinson. But the you know the number of people that came up to me that t- said they're listening to the pod, uh, they listen to it every single week, they appreciate it. Uh, the two every two weeks that we put it out. Um, so yeah, huge thanks to everybody. Huge thanks to, of course, everybody at the Free Press, Paul Simin and uh, Wendy Swatsky, who do such great work to make us look great on the site and uh, putting it out there. Um, and also a huge thanks to Adam here, our uh, long-suffering producer here. Oh, it's CJ my pleasure. And, and uh, making us also sound so great. And uh, Adam, uh, thanks to you too for organizing the last pod when you're way off on the other side of the ocean there. No worries. But doing it for on your vacation. And, uh, and a big thanks to everybody for you for listening. Uh, big miigwech, and we'll see you next time around. Adios. Adios.